in our Lunch and Learn program series. So first, what I want to do is I want to make sure I introduce you to the educators who are present here today. I'm sorry, Digging Deeper is the title of our program series. This is going to be our best practices for cucurbits. And I want to make sure that we do have the recording going, which we do. Great. So I want to introduce the other educators who are here and the others who have also worked very hard on this program. Uh, my name is Bob Bruner. I'm the ANR educator for Clay and Owen counties. Um, I recognize some names I see at this program. So I know several of you probably looked at my programs before either on my YouTube channel or gone in person. We also have Phil Cox from Vermilion County. He will be our moderator for today. So he's gonna be fielding questions. So if you have a question that you don't necessarily want to announce to everyone, feel free to send it to Phil. We also have Brooke Stefancic from Sullivan County and Tabby Flynn from Vigo County are also present. So if you guys have questions and I may not necessarily know the answer, one of them probably will. So we will do our best to make sure we cover everything for you. All right, so today's focus is going to be on cucurbits. These are really interesting plants. Um, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with cucurbits. I love to watch cucurbits grow. I think they make gorgeous flowers. I think they're great plants, but the trouble is, is I struggle to enjoy them in my food. Um, I despair my wife's cooking all the time and I pray that she forgives me, but um, until then, I will just enjoy them by teaching about them and trying to grow them myself. So um, cucurbits are an interesting group that contains primarily cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, other gourd fruit, things like that. Um, most of them are vining plants. They're also very, very resilient plants. Um, one of the reasons that they are so popular is due to the fact that they're very easy to grow uh, in a lot of ways, especially depending on what part of Indiana you're in. So I'm located in kind of the southwestern portion near Terre Haute. So growing cucurbits in this area, in this hardiness zone is actually pretty easy. They'll, they'll take off. They don't have a ton of requirements to make them successfully growing. Uh, one of the things that we actually did for one of the offices that I work in is we have a little community garden plot right out in front of our office. If you look at it, you think the soil quality isn't that great. We ended up growing a spaghetti squash plant that was probably four feet wide and about four feet tall. So they definitely will take off just about anywhere you put them so long as you take good care of them. All right, so a few facts about cucurbits. Um, I did mention we're kind of in the more southwestern area of Indiana where I am, so it's a little bit warmer. So these are warm weather plants and they really appreciate that kind of environment. They do have both vining and bush types. So they're kind of like our tomatoes in that sense where you can have determinate and indeterminate tomatoes. Well, in this case, you can have vining cucurbits that'll just spread across the ground. Like I'm sure you guys have seen plenty of them. Like you've grown spaghetti squash that may vine a bit more. Um, bush types are going to get very large, very broad leaves. They'll reach a good amount of area and height with them. Um, and they do tend to have male and female flowers on the same plant. However, there are a few species that are considered dioecious, which means that some plants may only have male flowers, whereas some plants may have females. So if you're considering cucurbits, one thing that I would counsel you to do is research it a little bit. Make sure that what you're interested in growing isn't dioecious, or if it is, that you're prepared for that. So your pollinating is going to be a little bit of concern there. You're gonna to wanna to make sure you manage that appropriately. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about pollination when we get into our pest section, because that's really where it's gonna be a little more important. Okay, so if you have ever been to any of my gardening programs, you've heard me harp on this over and over and over again, and I will continue to do so. This will be the hill upon which I die. Get your soil tested. Don't plant anything until you get your soil tested. You can put my gravestone right there, write it on there. I will always say it. Reasons for this is not only does it give you a good idea of the nutrients that are present, what you're doing, which is just good for gardening in general, but it also tells you the soil pH. Eucurbits tend to favor neutral pH. Now this is important because a lot of the things that you probably have already planted tend to favor more acidic soil conditions. So you're gonna wanna make sure you choose your spots. Now this doesn't prevent you in its entirety from planting cucurbits, 
but you are going to need to be aware of this. You may need to do a little manipulation or amendment of your soil to make sure you've got a good environment for them. So you, you may need to establish that one area that's guaranteed, this is where I'm growing my cucumbers, and then move everything else out from or away from that area. Now, when we plant cucurbits, we tend to plant them in a hill to allow for better drainage. And people tend to like just basically making a little hill of soil where they put in direct seeding six seeds into that hill as their kind of start for most cucurbit plants. Now, remember I said that they're warm weather plants, so you want to use elastic. Now, barring any unusual weather conditions, we should be past our last frost date, though Phil and uh, Brooke may know a little bit more than I do at this point. But to me, I would say most likely we're past it. You're probably safe, but keep your eyes open until we get to June, because if you remember last year, we got a real late cold snap at one point. Oops, I just passed, give me a second, there we go. All right, a little bit on maintenance of these plants. Now these are deep rooting plants, but they do not require much water at all. They can usually go with what's falling from the rain and they need only about an inch of it per week. So you do not wanna be taking a bucket out there to your, to your cucumbers or your squash and dousing them. They only need a little bit of water. They also have low nitrogen content requirements. They don't need much, but they do need a decent amount of phosphorus and potassium. So one thing you can do is if you're like me and you like growing roses, look at your fertilizers that may say on the box, rose fertilizer or something like that. They tend to be higher in phosphorus content, which means they're perfectly usable so long as there isn't a labeling requirement on them to use for your um, different cucurbits. You just basically need to make sure that that phosphorus and that potassium, your P and your K, are being kept up to the proper amount. Um, one thing that, <clears throat> excuse me, one thing that I think a lot of gardeners tend to forget when they're doing cucurbits, remember how I was saying we grew really bushy ones at our uh, extension office? Well, these plants cover a lot of space. They can expand out really, really far, especially if you're taking good care of them. So you need to make sure that when you plan for cucurbits, you have given them that space to be able to grow. And that's gonna allow for the plants to get more photosynthetic area, and it's gonna allow for larger fruit to be coming off of those vines. So even though you think you have enough, you may wanna give yourself just a little bit more, just in case, because these plants will take off. And sometimes they will take off really, really quickly. All right, so now to the crux of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, what I wanted to focus on for today was our diseases and our pests of these plants because these really kind of define how we're going to be taking care of them. Um, like I said, these plants can often just take off and do good on their own without a whole lot of input. So I think it's better to focus on keeping them good and healthy while they do so. So a lot of the diseases I'm going to cover, you're probably going to be at least peripherally familiar with because they affect a lot of different other garden species. Um, you're going to see a few diseases of tomatoes in particular that are going to be occurring also on cucurbits. All right, so our first one to talk about, this is a very common one, bacteria, bacterial wilt. This is in tomatoes and several other garden plants. It's caused by a bacterium known as Erwinia trichiophylla. Um, what you will see is that the vines will begin to wilt. Now this isn't necessarily the easiest symptom to identify because there could be a lot of things that are going to simply make the vines wilt. Everything from too little water to maybe too little fertilizer or too little nutrient content in the soil. And as these vines begin to wilt, you're gonna see it slowly spread to all of the rest of the plant. Now, one thing you can do is if you're not sure if you have bacterial wilt is you can choose a vine or a small branch that may be dying off. And what you can do is you can snip it. You're gonna take the two ends of the branches there and push them against each other and pull them apart. If you see a stringy substance stretch between the two ends that you've cut, that is bacterial wilt. The bacteria makes this kind of sticky, sticky nasty substance throughout the plant's vascular system. And that's a way to check to see if that's an issue there. Now, of course, you're going to want to know how to prevent this. Well, bacterial wilt can be transmitted either through water splashing between an infected plant and an uninfected plant, or it can be transmitted by an insect, namely the striped cucumber beetle. 
The striped cucumber beetle is essentially the same species as the spotted cucumber beetle, and I'm going to show you a little bit of that later on. So one way to help control this is to simply manage the insect and you will manage the disease. Um, unfortunately, once the plant is infected, it's probably going to be best to keep it away from other plants that you are concerned about. And remember, bacterial wilt is not limited to just simply cucurbits. All right, powdery mildew. This is one that I often, um, even I find a little confusing because I'll get pictures of this sent to me and people will be asking me what's going on. And if you look at this picture, which isn't the highest quality, um, you'll notice there are lots of whitish spots covering the green leaf that's beginning to yellow at the edges. And I could look at this and go, well, that could be insect damage or that could be any number of things. So what I'd advise all of you to do is to get nice and close to the leaf to check. If you have powdery mildew, you are going to see a powder-like substance that may even look a little furry on the surface of the leaf. Powdery mildew is a fungus. It's spread by these two fungi, and I am not even going to attempt to butcher the names of these two. Um, and you're going to notice this powdery growth on the upper surface of the leaf. Now, the reason for this is, is that those, that, that material you see, those are the hyphae and the fruiting bodies of that fungus, and they're trying to be open to the air, so they're on the upper surface where they can get into the air more easily. The effects of powdery mildew are going to cause stunting on your plants, as well as distortion of leaf surfaces as basically the fungus is now using the plant as its energy source and it's taking away the nutrients from it. This doesn't necessarily mean that you won't get fruit out of the plant, but it does mean that your fruit is probably not going to be very high quality, they're not going to be very large, and the plant's just, it's losing its photosynthetic capacity. Um, things that cause this are things like if you plant things too close together and you've had high, uh, periods of high moisture or if you're near other sources of powdery mildew. So you're going to want to keep an eye on that as you plan and plant these particular um, cucurbits. All right, downy mildew is another one that is of some concern. This again is another fungus and what you're going to see happen here is you're going to see the leaves will begin to yellow. In those yellow areas, if you look at the image, and I apologize for the image quality, you can see the brown spots on the leaves. These are lesions being formed by this fungus, and they're just slowly going to start in the yellow areas and then expand outwards. Um, the good thing is, is that this particular disease will not affect the fruits that you're developing, except it will affect cantaloupe. So some of the melons may be at risk there. So you're going to want to keep an eye on that if you're one of our melon growers. Typically, downy mildew is really going to be um, present during wet conditions. Now, this year, that's a little bit good because um, even though it's kind of cloudy and we did get a little bit of rain last night, at least in this area of the state, um, it's actually fairly dry right now. We have not gotten all that much moisture. There's only a little bit I've seen standing. So right now, you're probably safe unless we start getting a period of extended rains. Again, planting things further apart will help prevent this disease. So don't keep crushing things together. Make sure you give them adequate space. All right, gummy stem blight. This is another one of our bacterial diseases, and you can actually see the evidence of this bacterial disease quite clearly on this junction of vines right here. If you look at the image more closely, you can see little black and red spots. This is where the disease has split the plant. It's formed lesions that are reaching into portions of the vascular system and it's exuding this nasty reddish brownish substance. Overall, really unpleasant thing to look at, I'm afraid. So this is caused by Didymella brionniae and it can cause black rot of the fruit as well. So you're not only looking at the plant being damaged, but what you're going to be getting out of it is also going to end up getting ruined. Um, you're going to see brown spotting of the leaves and the stems will split into cankers that are going to exude that substance that I just mentioned. You can hopefully identify this by taking a look at some of the spots that are occurring. They may have a ringed appearance. Now that also goes for a few different diseases. So you're going to want to put together the things here. You're going to be looking for the splits into cankers, look for the spots with a ringed appearance around them. And of course, if you have fruit now, you can use that as the indicator, but hopefully you, you find the plants that are 
disease with this long before they bear fruit. There isn't a whole lot you can do to try to recover the plant once this occurs. The thing that I would probably suggest here is you probably just want to destroy the plant to prevent it from spreading to other ones. All right, Alternaria. This is another popular one in our gardens, I'm afraid. This hits several of our plants and gardens. Alternaria is fairly telltale. The lesions you can see here on the leaf really do kind of tell the whole story. You're going to see lesions expanding on leaves that are going to kind of be ringed in a yellow, lighter green, and then they're just going to have brown concentric rings leading into darker brown areas, and that's pretty telltale of Alternaria to identify it. Um, this one we really know well because it hits our tomatoes all the time, um, and it will also hit other species in your garden as well. So I would use that as something to help protect yourself. If you start seeing sensitive plants become infected with Alternaria, you know that you need to also start watching out for it on your cucurbits as well. And of course, I already described our small circular tan spots there that can enlarge to greater than an inch in diameter with that bullseye appearance. So keep that in mind as well. These will get much, much larger. They're going to get almost an inch. So if you begin to see that develop, you know that you're looking at alternaria. Ultimately, this is going to cause pretty severe leaf drop, which in turn will begin to reduce your fruit quality. So when you start dropping leaves, that is a warning sign. When leaves begin to hit the ground with any disease plant, but especially Alternaria, you need to get those off the ground. They are now disease vectors and they can spread around your garden. So don't mess around with it. As soon as one leaf hits the ground, you start going full sanitation. Get this stuff away from your plants. Okay, I think this is the last disease that I was gonna cover here. This is called cucumber mosaic virus. This is one of the few viruses that I'll talk about during gardening programs. Uh, the name essentially says it all. You can see that the leaf is getting distorted here and you can see a kind of a mosaic of different colors patched around this leaf surface here, ruining its photosynthetic capacity and distorting the surface of the leaf. So this one is relatively common and it can affect a lot of different cucurbits from your cucumbers to your zucchini to your spaghetti squash. Namely, you're going to see some stunting and you're going to have that leaf modeling as your signs there. It will also cause you to have irregularly shaped fruit. Now, the good thing is, is that the spread of this particular disease, it, doesn't depend on splashing water or plant closeness, it's spread by an insect. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, I actually had one more disease to talk about, and this one's a really important one too. So I don't know if, if any of you guys have ever dealt with this before, but when I visit clients or I get calls, this one I find to be extremely common, blossom end rot. Um, what will happen is you'll get these great fruit developing. The, you look at them, you think, well, this is going to end up great. I'm going to have a great harvest. And then all of a sudden, the distal tip of the fruit suddenly begins to blacken or brown, and it just begins to go bad. It starts to rot. This is blossom end rot. The good news is, is that this is easily prevented. Blossom end rot occurs when there is a lack of calcium in the soil. And this happened at our extension office too. Um, our, we have a, a community gardener who's been working very, very hard on this. And she wasn't sure what was going on. And we looked at it and went, well, this is blossom end rot. All you need to do is add calcium for the next year and we'll be fine. Um, this especially happens during rapid growth. So if you've been fertilizing the Dickens out of something or if you've got a really good uh, soil profile and you see your fruit just grow super fast, that is when you want to watch out because if you have uh, if you have too little calcium, the plant will grow faster than it can supply calcium to itself. And then you'll get the end rot occurring. Again, this is why I harp on soil testing. Blossom end rot doesn't just happen in cucurbits. It can happen in a lot of different plants and vegetables. So just check your calcium amounts, make sure they're good. You can easily prevent this one. All right, so getting on to our insect pests. I'm gonna apologize, it was a little bit challenging to find pictures that really told, told tell the whole story to you. Um, so hopefully these will work. I will tell you as much about them as I can. 
Okay, so these are squash bugs. Squash bugs, um, we are all very familiar with if you've ever gardened <laughs> even once in your life because they will hit a lot of different things. So they will primarily be focused on your cucurbits. Um, these insects are sap feeding insects that can easily transmit pathogens because basically what they're doing is their mouth parts are a syringe and they'll just poke that syringe right into leaf surfaces and other things and begin to drink the fluid out of the plant. Unfortunately, just like a syringe, anything that's covering it's going to get transmitted into the tissue and that's what they do. They're going to primarily attack squash and pumpkins, though they aren't going to be that discriminating. They're going to go after whatever they can eat, primarily within the cucurbit family. They're going to resemble stink bugs, except they typically are longer, thinner, and they're going to have a brown coloration to them. And unfortunately, this picture just doesn't do them justice, I'm afraid. But one thing you can watch out for is you can look for their eggs, which are really, really easy to find. If you look at the picture on the right side, those red things you see on that leaf right there, those are their eggs. They'll glue their eggs to the undersides of the plants they want to eat. So if you do your monitoring, all you need to do is find those eggs and you can scrape them right off. Uh, they, they may, they're, they're stuck on there pretty good. So you may need to watch that part so you don't accidentally damage the leaf, but you can scrape them off, put them in a bucket of soapy water and you will be good. The adults are fairly large-ish so I would honestly say you can do the same thing for the adults. When you find an adult, it's probably feeding. They usually feed anywhere between five and 10 minutes at a time. These guys are like cattle. They're not gonna move very readily. So you can scrape them off too into a bucket of soapy water and you'll probably do a good portion of your own insect management right then. Uh, in general, I really don't advise a whole lot of pesticide usage on them. In my opinion, um, manual removal is probably going to work out better and be cheaper for you unless potentially damaging to other plants or other uh, beneficial insects that you want to focus on. All right, squash vine borer. This is everyone's favorite nightmare when it comes to cucurbits. This is the one that um, I cannot even tell you how many hundreds of client calls I've gotten on squash vine borer. Um, these are a unique insect. So these uh, are moths. Um, this insect over here on the left that has this red coloration is an adult squash vine borer known as a clear wing moth. And what it does, it's a pollinator. It will run around pollinating, drinking nectar, and they will, they have disguised themselves to look like wasps. So they look like something much more dangerous. Uh, they're going to come out of cocoons in late June, early July immediately try to find a mate, lay their eggs, and then the larva will burrow into vines. Now, if you recall earlier, I talked about watching how you're doing your pollination. Now, the reason I brought this up is because one of the ways to try to prevent squash vine borer and other insects is to put row covers over your vines or your bushes. This is a great way to prevent squash vine borer from being successful on your plants because they're gonna first seek out a mate. And if they can't find a mate and they can't find enough food, they'll just die without laying eggs and you won't get an infested plant. Um, but unfortunately, if you put a row cover over something, most cucurbits are reliant on pollinators. They do need insects to visit their plants. So you will have to choose the times where you're going to lift your row covers to allow insect access so you can get pollinating done because if you don't, you're basically growing vines that are making really pretty flowers and nothing else. Um, normally in evening times, you're going to have better chances of getting pollinator activity and not get the interaction with squash vine borer. Um, you can also try to outweight them. So hopefully the adults will die or lose mating chances to do that. Or if you don't want to take the risk, you can literally just manually pollinate things with a Q-tip and just go to town on those. Um, I seriously doubt most of you are going to take that option, but it is a viable one. Now, the reason we hate them so much is because the larva will burrow into the vines. Um, and what they'll do is they will consume the vascular tissue within the vines. And basically, imagine if something ate all of your circulatory system. Um, you're not going to survive very long. These plants are actually a lot tougher in that regard. Um, with a small infestation, your vines will probably be just fine. They will probably do fairly well. But with more severe infestations, uh, the plant's dead. It just takes a while to die, unfortunately. 
All right, this is another one that I mentioned earlier. Hey, hey Bob, before we move on, yeah, there was a question about um, a couple of questions here about squash fine borer. Uh, if you find a mass of eggs, can you cut off the leaf rather than scrape off? Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can ab absolutely just cut off the leaf. Um, I wouldn't necessarily advise doing that though, because when the eggs are on there, the leaf is still very viable. That's still photosynthetic surf uh, surface that's doing you a favor. So that's why I usually promote just scraping them off carefully. Um, but if you want to take the leaf off of there, so long as the plant has a good amount of leaves left and can still photosynthesize, then yeah, you could feasibly just take it off. Just be aware that when you damage the plant, you are creating a wound, and that is a potential disease entry point. So keep that in mind. Um, um, I see okay. someone's asking, when does squash need pollinated too? Um, so unfortunately, the pollination period is going to coincide pretty closely for when squash vine borer comes up. So it's generally a few weeks, I believe, after squash vine borer comes up. Basically, you're going to see the flowers when they come out, those great big yellow flowers on a lot of our squash. And that's essentially when pollination is going to start up. And it's going to last for a uh, few weeks in there, probably about four weeks worth of time. So um, you'll just have to choose those moments when you're going to allow the insects in. It's not going to be like you're choosing one or two days. You're going to have to choose a few periods of time in a day where you want to make sure you allow pollinator access if you're using row covers. Oh, one thing I wanted to add in, add in there, and I for, almost forgot to, there is a way to monitor for squash vine borer. For some reason, these insects are attracted to the color yellow. You can actually set out a pan of soapy water that is in a yellow pan, and you will see the squash vine borer just fly straight into it without stopping. Um, and that is one way you can try to monitor for their presence. If you only have a few squash vine borer, that can actually form a control method too. So you might try giving that a chance if you've got a few or if you're just really worried that they're gonna show up. And thank you, Phil, for pointing those questions out to me. I didn't have my chat open right then. All right, so our spotted and striped cucumber beetle here. Um, these I consider really interesting insects because when I was a grad student, I had the chance to study these quite a bit. These are actually, uh, another name for them is southern corn rootworm. So these will actually attack corn, they'll attack soybeans, though most of the time we really hate them when they're on our cucurbits because that's their primary host in residential areas. They're going to be going after the stuff in your garden. Um, they can attack a lot of different plants in your gardens and they will go after all cucurbits. They are not discriminating. So they're our generalist herbivore. The adults are going to be emerging in about mid-May, so coming up here in another week or so, and they will feed throughout the entirety of the summer. Um, the larvae are going to be consuming the roots of several plants, um, and the adults will also be leaf feeding on the plants themselves. So they're just kind of a nightmare all around. Now the good thing is, or at least the good thing for the insect, is that the adult and the larvae don't cross paths. They're going to stay separated the larvae are essentially going to be grubs that are in the ground and they're gonna be feeding on those roots. Whereas the adults, you can see they have that obvious color at the spotting. Um, there are a few different pesticides that are effective on them. And I do know that there's some research about applying BT products onto these insects, which, are, which is a chemical that uses a protein that will only affect insects um, and they can sometimes be effective against diabrotica species, which is one of these. So if you're thinking about what kind of control methods to use with them, um, you may want to look into that a little bit or talk to an extension educator to help you choose the right product for what you're wanting to do. Uh, spotted and striped cucumber beetles, they will spread diseases, unfortunately. I believe they are one of the vectors for our cucumber mosaic virus, as is our squash bug. All right, I went through that quicker than I thought I would. So um, I put my contact information here. Uh, you guys can feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'm more than happy to talk to you about my plants, and I do a ton of programs on these things. I also have a link to our Purdue Ed store, which has publications that you can use to help you figure out some of your problems, as well as the Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab. Uh, they are great at helping you figure out what's going on with your plants. 
uh, no matter what. They will help you figure it out. They have the diagnostic tools to be able to get down to the really hard problems. And I just wanted to include at the end here are all of our educators who have worked really hard to help provide this program for all of you. Please feel free to reach out to any of them. We are here to help and we are happy to. All right, so let me look at some of these questions here. I see one. I see a couple, okay. Um, so can you successfully grow cucumbers in pots? You can successfully start cucumbers in pots, um, but they're, they're probably going to expand out of that pot. Remember, these are deep rooting plants. So uh, they may need that extra space, not only for the top growth that could expand outwards, but also the below ground growth because those roots are gonna go far. So you can get a start on them then but you're probably going to need to move them outside. Um, let's see, will a layer of straw help prevent diseases and cucurbits? Yes, so if you put a layer of straw down, um, what you're doing there is you're going to prevent any splashing coming from the ground surface, any pathogens down there from splashing upwards into the plants during rain periods. Um, and it'll also probably prevent some of the water absorption into the soil during wet periods. You're just going to want to monitor it a little bit to make sure that there is enough water getting to the plants. Um, like I said, they don't need much, but you may want to keep an eye on that part of it. Um, and can cucurbits be grown in late summer? Uh, yeah, in my experience, you can get them as far out as September and early October. Um, I don't know if they will be as successful if you don't plant them um, during this period of time. Like right now would be an ideal time to really start planting them maybe next week. Uh, but I like I've had cucurbit vines like I had some spaghetti squash growing all the way into October a few years ago and it didn't produce as many fruit but the fruit were good. I mean they grew to a good size and it was a, but it was a small plant. We also didn't have ideal conditions there so that could have played a part in it too. Okay so someone is asking how far apart would you plant cucumbers and corn? This is a small garden with raised beds. So I would probably at least make sure there is a distance of two feet in between corn and cucurbits. But I also think that two, there should be a kind of a two foot margin between cucurbits and any other plant there. Um, this way, because corn roots are going to spread a little bit and that's gonna give some root space, whereas the cucurbit roots are gonna go deep. And then that way the cucurbit leaves will have room to spread and not come into contact with the corn and begin trying to choke it out. Um, but a lot of it's also going to depend on the type of plant. How big is your corn? How big, how big of a bush do you get out of eucucurbits? So that will play a part in it there. Um, and I kind of answered, Pat, I kind of answered your question, what's the recommended spaces? I, I would say at least two feet. Um, and bigger plants you need to make, may consider more. So like if I were putting down my hills before the plant grew, I'd probably put like five feet between the next hill where I did my seeding. Um, let's see, can you place a hill of cucumbers in the middle of a perennial flower bed? Will they choke out the perennials? Um, if they get too close, yeah, they're going to steal sunlight from those perennials. But if you can create a nice space around them, they shouldn't have too many nasty interactions. And um, that will actually assist in pollinators coming to your, cu uh, your cucumbers as well. Because the pollinators may get attracted to the perennial flowers and then they're going to see the, the cucumbers as another potential food source. So you're just going to want to keep in mind, remember when we talk about leaves with these plants, they have big broad leaves, which means they are greedy for sunlight and they're going to steal it from everything around them. Um, let's see. So Brooke actually just messaged me with a really good point. Brooke, do you want to talk about that a little bit since you brought it up? Sure. Um, so I had a question, the question about the corn, and I just wanted to mention um, corn doesn't do great raised in small spaces. Um, you usually need to have at least a four by four square to ensure pollination or you will not get any ears on the corn. Um, the smaller the corn plot is, probably the more irregular pollination will be. So if you see if you get corn ears at all, you may see kernels missing and stuff. And a lot of that has to do with pollination. So um, just uh, be mindful of that to always plant them kind of in a 
in a square and a clump when you plant corn instead of in a long line or two lines. You really want at least a four by four square. Yeah, and remember our, our, our corn is going to be wind pollinated, so it's not going to respond to the same things that your cucurbits or a lot of your other garden plants will. Let's see, do we have any other questions? Susan's was the last one I saw. Um, I do want to mention that we are asking um, you guys to fill out a survey. Um, even if you just attended one of the series, I'm going to put the link in the chat and we will also be emailing it. This just helps us um, report back to Purdue how our um, webinars went and also lets us get feedback from you guys on if you have any changes or other things you'd like to see. All right, guys. So uh, I think that's all we had for you. Brooke just posted the link in the chat for you guys to look at. And as always, if you have additional questions or if there's something you'd like to hear about more on this topic or any other we've covered, please feel free to contact us anytime. Um, and we'd be more than happy to help you out.